Father, Lord, thank you um, for everything. Uh, today is, once again, a reminder of, uh, of all that you do for us, all the blessings that you give, um, all the um, circumstances of our lives, the things you put in our lives, Lord. Certainly, when we think about our lives, we tend to focus on the negatives. We tend to think of our problems, our issues, um, whatever stress that we might have to deal with. But, Lord, we also know that in our lives, there's always something to be thankful for. Um, from very small things to very big things, Lord, everything that you do um, for us, everything that you are to us, Lord, uh, we have plenty to be thankful for, and so I just, I just want us to, I just want to pray that you would help us remember um, what you've done, help us to count our blessings, and I'm, I'm thankful for everyone who could show up today uh, to, to worship with us, to fellowship with, uh, with one another here, and I just pray, Lord, that uh, um, we would rejoice as we leave and after we leave, and as we continue on our week and continue on our lives, uh, whatever that may be, whatever that may entail, Lord, I just pray, Lord, that uh, you would give us a thankful heart, uh, just always remembering uh, your goodness uh, in our lives. And I just pray all this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. <clears throat> Good morning. Uh, <clears throat> so here, here at church, we like to ascribe to God a number of holy, awesome qualities. We say that God is love, right? It's a, it's a famous uh, verse in the Bible where we talk about how God is, you know, God is love. He is loving and compassionate. We say that God is good. And sometimes we exclaim that he is great, right? Just like the song that we sing, um, uh, how great is our God? Uh, so how holy, how awesome, how mighty is our God? When we think about who God is, um, there's a lot to think about. Uh, and certainly things that we can't really uh, fathom uh, in all its complexity of, of just who God is. So we come to church here and uh, for him, because he is worthy of our time, worthy of our respect and admiration. Whenever I'm feeling kind of down, kind of out, whenever I'm feeling uh, somewhat depressed, um, it helps me cope with life. It helps me cope with um, issues, troubles, struggles. When I think about all the amazing attributes and qualities of God, you know, if, if I think about my life, um, it's, it's not always a, a pleasant thing to, to think about. I know there are some people out there who, who, who love themselves and love their lives, but uh, I think for a lot of people, most people, um, they'll recognize that there are um, troubles and there are failures, um, uh, things that we've done that uh, certainly we may not we can't say that we're proud of every single thing, right? I never feel like I'm doing everything right. But then I think about God, and God's that, that foothold, that stronghold, that only point of stability. It gives me comfort to know that, that we have God with us, and that God knows about us and cares for us. So today we're going to talk about a specific and nice uh, quality of God, or attribute of God, or however you want to call it, um, something that we use to describe Him. And of course it's going to be something to be thankful for, um, but before we get to that, uh, as always, uh, before we, uh, we're going to be continuing our, our uh, trek through the Bible, and I'm going to re uh, remind us of the events that we've been covering for the past few weeks. Um, so last week, the topic was whatever it takes. 
right? The, the Israelites were waging war against the people in Canaan. We've been talking about that war for uh, a few weeks now, about a month, right? Some of them have, uh, some of the people of Canaan have already been destroyed by the Israelites. However, not all the people of Canaan were destroyed. Um, as the Israelites were waiting on God's next orders, they, they're pretty faithful to God at this point in time. Um, they're always listening for, for God um, to tell them what to do, where to go, and who to fight. And while they're during a moment of sort of peace, uh, waiting out uh, God's next orders, they saw a delegation come out to meet them, a group of, uh, of people just, you know, in the horizon, just coming over. And they, this group of people, they claim to have been from far, far away. They were wearing torn clothes. They were, they were wearing worn out sandals. Um, and their food was all dried and old. And they were carrying around moldy bread. Um, they, they certainly didn't look like a very extravagant group of people. And, and so these were signs that uh, these people were actually distant travelers. Um, they've been traveling a long time and, and, and they've been kind of getting worn out and their food is kind of running low and dry. Uh, the Israelites were somewhat suspicious. We kind of saw that. But they were convinced. They were suspicious in the beginning, but then they got convinced by their appearances um, they, they checked everything over and they, the Israelites thought to themselves, yeah, these, these guys look like travelers from far, far away. They should be okay. So they gave them a peace treaty. They swore it before God. However, of course, as we know, three days later, the Israelites find out that the Gibeonites were actually their neighbors. Um, the, the group of travelers were actually pretending to be travelers from far, far away. The Gibeonites had received mercy from God, however, because they humbled themselves and showed that they were willing to do anything for the salvation of their lives. And God honors that. God has shown through the Bible that time and time again, if the people are willing to do whatever it takes to receive mercy from God, God will grant them that mercy. So this shows, of course, if, if you read the Bible, sometimes people wonder, you know, what, what about all the people who aren't Israelites? How are they supposed to be saved if God only favors the Israelites? But God doesn't just favor the Israelites. Uh, the, from, even from the beginning, even from uh, this book of Joshua here, um, reaching out to God for those who weren't Israelites was never some impossible thing. It was just a, a very difficult thing. However, the Israelites were the only group to ally themselves with the Israelites. All the others, uh, all the other people of Canaan, continued to fight and make war. And so we're going to be jumping ahead in time now. This is a few years ahead. If you look in the Bible, it's uh, about a few chapters ahead. Um, and, the, and the Bible really just, you know, after, uh, the Bible first talks about Jericho and I, uh, the battle against I in, in greater detail. And then all of a sudden, just kind of just, Everything just happens. Like they, they, they went and defeated this, and they went and defeated them. And so five years kind of have passed um, since they began this campaign, this war to take the land of Canaan. They have not yet completed their mission. We're not done yet. There's still land to be taken, but they've made good progress. They've defeated many kings, and they've conquered a good amount of land. So it was uh, finally time. Uh, to kind of slow things down um, and, and divide up the land and, and, and let Israelites kind of just find places to stay, live, and settle down. And this is where we're going to begin our reading. And this takes place, uh, well, this, uh, if you brought your Bibles, this is in Joshua chapter 14. And I'm going to just start by reading 6 through 9. Now the people of Judah approached Joshua at Gilgal, and Caleb, son of Jephunneh, the Kenizzite, said to him, You know what the Lord said to Moses, the man of God, at Kadesh Barnea, about you and me. 
I was 40 years old when Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent me from Kadesh Barnea to explore the land. And I brought him back a report according to my convictions. But my fellow Israelites who went up with me made the hearts of the people melt in fear. I, however, followed the Lord my God wholeheartedly. So on that day, Moses swore to me, the land on which your feet have walked will be your inheritance and that of your children forever, because you have followed the Lord my God wholeheartedly. Uh, I hope you guys remember Caleb. Um, he's kind of going to be our topic uh, for today. Um, and if you and as as we read this, hopefully you, it kind of jogged your mind a bit. This is also sort of a recap of things that happened. And for us, it, we talked about it a few weeks ago. Um, before the Israelites, you know, they wandered. Uh, we talked about the wandering in forty years uh, in the wilderness. Before that. Right? How, what started it all? It all began when Moses sent out 12 spies to investigate Canaan. Now, of course, we saw that 10 of those spies, the majority, um, quite overwhelming majority, uh, gave, a bad report, uh, gave a bad report. And as Caleb puts it here, um, the report made the hearts of the people melt in fear. It was up to these Israelites to, to show these people that um, this king, this land was theirs for the taking, and they did not um, instill much confidence. Uh, Caleb, however, he wasn't one of those ten. He was one of the two. The other two, Caleb and Joshua, were the only two spies who believed in God, who saw that the land was good and that the people were uh, beatable, shall we say. And he, he told the Israelites to fight. Now, now, since we started this uh, book of Joshua, Joshua has been getting all the attention lately in our messages. He is the leader, um, and he gets the book named after him. But in case you all forgot about Caleb, here he is. He's back. Um, he's not. Uh, he doesn't get talked about much about the Bible. This is probably uh, one of his final few appearances. Um, and as Caleb says, however, he followed the Lord wholeheartedly. Just because he's a minor character in the Bible doesn't mean we should ignore him. Because he's actually um, one of the more faithful people in the entire Bible. He gets his share of the inheritance because he followed the Lord. Now we're going to finish the reading. And this is uh, in verses 10 to 15. And it reads, Now then, just as the Lord had promised, he has kept me alive for 45 years since the time he said this to Moses, while Israel moved about in the wilderness. So here I am today, 85 years old. I'm still as strong today as the day Moses sent me out. I'm just as vigorous to go out to battle now as I was then. Now give me this hill country, the Lord that the Lord promised me that day. You yourself heard then that the Anakites were there and their cities were large and fortified, but the Lord helping me, I will drive them out, just as he said. Then Joshua blessed Caleb, son of Jephunneh, and gave him Hebron as his inheritance. So Hebron has belonged to Caleb, son of Jephunneh, the Kenizzite, ever since, because he followed the Lord, the God of Israel wholeheartedly. Uh, verse 15. Hebron used to be called Kiriath Arba after Arba, who was the greatest man among the Anakites. Then the land had rest from war. Alright, so um, Caleb, as we see here, what, as he talks about, as we just read, Caleb was 40 years old when he was sent as a, as a spy. Not exactly what we call young. Um, it's certainly not what we'd expect as spies. I mean, uh, when, when we uh, watch James Bond movies, we don't uh, look for a, an older um, older Bond, although they, some of them do get uh, fairly old. But we prefer the, our spies to be younger, um, more, you know, active. Uh, of course, 40 is not, like, terribly old either. Regardless... 
he did have to endure 40 long years through the wilderness. Now, everyone else from his generation, um, as, as we talked about, they died. They, he, they were disobedient, so eventually they all just kind of passed away. Uh, but he survived. Caleb, John, uh, Caleb and Joshua, just the two of them, were the lone survivors. Now, why did they survive? It's because of the promise. Just as the Lord promised, he has kept me alive for 45 years. And not only has um, Caleb survived, but he's in great condition. You know, he says that uh, in, in one of the verses, he says that he's as strong today as he was 45 years ago. And in case you might argue, well, that doesn't say much. Maybe when he was 40, he had the body of an 85-year-old. Well, he does add that he's just as vigorous to go out to battle now as he was then. So he's not like your, your grandparents. He's not uh, sitting in a rocking chair petting a cat. This is an 85-year-old battle-hardened warrior. Okay, he, He's still going out during war. He's still cutting down people left and right. Um, he's like those old Chinese kung fu masters that can still kick your butt before they kick the bucket, right? So he doesn't... He, so he's, 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 he's good to go. 85 years old, he's still, he's still fighting and kicking, and, he, uh, and he's got the, the strength in him. Um, and, and just hear what, what land he wants to take. He wants to take the land of the Anakites, which, uh, if, if you remember from way back when, when we read it, the Anakites were the giants. Okay, so he didn't just want to take any land. He wanted to take the, the land of the strongest people, the land of the, and he also says that they're fortified cities. Um, he wants to just, he wants the challenge. And he doesn't ask for help from the other tribes. He just tells Joshua, just say the word. Say the word and I'll go out there and with the Lord's help, I'm gonna drive them out. I'm gonna take the land. And it was so, it happened. He wasn't bluffing, he wasn't joking. Uh, he wasn't joking. Grandpa Caleb went out there and showed them the what for. Now what spoke to me as I read this? Well, this chapter really speaks to me about God's faithfulness. There it is. The quality of God that I conveniently omitted from the introduction as I, as I talked about God. Now one thing I just kind of didn't uh, touch on yet, as we're touching on now, is faith. God's faithfulness. God is faithful. Now, there are many miracles in the Bible. We talk about them all the time. Uh, we see them uh, in, in, in the words of God. The creation was a miracle. The water into wine, the parting the sea. Um, a lot of these miracles, you know, they show God's greatness, God's goodness. It, it's supposed to inspire awe and, and make us um, wonder and marvel at what God can do. But what God did for Caleb was quite different. It was just to be faithful to a promise. He allowed Caleb to live as long as he needed to live for this promise to be fulfilled. And he even enabled Caleb to accomplish what needed to be done. Caleb made sure to give credit to God, that the Lord helping me, I will take the land. When, the, when it comes to the promises of God, you know, notice most of us are never going to experience what Caleb experienced. But can you imagine how Caleb would have felt in that time? God's promise had to be upheld. Caleb was not allowed to die until God's promise was fulfilled. Every day we we live in uncertainty because we don't have that same, we don't have the same and specific promise that Caleb did. You know, God doesn't promise us that we're going to live uh, 40 years. We don't know whether we're, we'll still be here tomorrow. We don't know whether we'll be here in 10 years from now. Maybe we'll live to 100. Maybe we'll live to um, just to see the next day. We like to think that everything will be fine tomorrow, but... Uh, there's no way we can say for sure. And 
And as I say that, it's kind of, kind of odd because we're living in a time and place of perhaps uh, some of the most peace and security and, and, and health and medicine that, that the world has, uh, has ever experienced. But when Caleb received the promise, he was 40 years old, um, he could say for sure that he would be alive the next day. To the next day, to the next. And he was living in a time of war. He's, he was always fighting his battles. And when everyone else around him, everyone else he knew, that the possibility of dying to sickness, to old age, to war, he knew without a doubt that God would keep him alive and well for at least 40 years until he got his land. He was guaranteed 40 years of life until he received his inheritance. That's amazing to think about. Just think about the peace he would have in his heart to know that God had a time and place set for his passing. And his passing would not happen until he finished everything, his purpose and his goals in life. We're not going to get, we're not going to get that same promise you in a vision, but God will still be faithful to us in many other ways. The Bible is full of many other promises for us in this life that we may be confident in trusting in him. The important thing, however, is that this is not some one-sided faithfulness. God was faithful to Caleb because Caleb was faithful to God. Um, with that said, let's end in a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, uh, I just thank you, Lord, for this story from your word. Um, all, all, uh, thank you, Lord, that you have given us the word of God, um, that we may study from it, that we may learn from it, um, that we may receive hope uh, from it, Lord, to know that um, that you're always uh, watching out for us, always uh, taking care of us. And in this story in particular, Lord, we see your faithfulness. Uh, when people are faithful to you, you are faithful to them. And I just pray, Lord, that we will be faithful. I pray, oh Lord, that you would give us a spirit and a heart of faithfulness, uh, a yearning for you, Lord, uh, for your word, that we may um, um, just dwell in your presence, in your spirit, in faith, hope, and love. I just pray, Lord, that you would uh, encourage us to be men and women of, of faith, men and women of, of, of God, godliness, that we would um, come to, to love you more and more each day and to love each other as your children, that we would cr create a, a peace, uh, peaceful place uh, to worship you, to, to sing the songs to you, Lord, to, to embrace you for who you are, for all that you've done for our lives. And I just pray all this in the name of Lord, Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Mm -hmm. Yeah.